our hands together that we serve a great God this morning. How many are thankful that we serve a God who is greater? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How are we feeling this morning, 11 o'clock? That don't sound like you got more sleep than the 930. I, I'm not going to lie to you. The 930 like blew this thing out of the park. So I'm going to ask one more time. I'm going to give you another chance. How are we, how are we feeling this morning, 11 o'clock? Much better, much better, amen. Well, like I said, 930 was was pretty turnt, pretty lit, pretty awesome, but I believe that God's been speaking to me all week that something special was going to happen in this service, but I need, I need some expectant people. I need some people that expect something special to happen, not that just came to church to go through the motions, but who came expecting God to do something different, amen? Amen. Can we put our hands together before we get started, though, for our volunteers? Let them know that we love and appreciate them. Some of them have been here since 7.30 a.m., which is before any of y'all's alarm clocks went off. Don't even front. So we appreciate y'all. We love y'all. What's cool about them is that they preach the sermon before the sermon's ever preached with their life. Like they live it because they prepare the way for Jesus to be able to show up because none of this just happens. Amen. We show up and we think like every, the lights are there, the sound's on, everything. Everybody, but it just, it just happens. It doesn't just happen. Amen. And so we appreciate our volunteers. We love our volunteers and all of that good stuff. But I'm ready to dig into the word on this uh, beautiful, chilly October 1st. Amen. October 1st, which is crazy because Nicole's due date is October 31st. So that means we're in the month of due, which means ready or not, which I assure you I am not. Uh, here comes the baby, so we're, we're looking forward to that. Y'all pray for me, but uh, with, with that being said, let's just, let's go ahead and read our Bibles, okay? I think I need to read my Bible. Uh, 1 Kings chapter number 19, if you brought your Bible with you, if you would, please turn with me there. Uh, 1 Kings chapter number 19. Here we see this, this great man by the name of Elijah, this great powerful prophet Elijah, and, and, and we see him uh, in this moment of, of vulnerability, I mean, no, every once in a while you have to be vulnerable with the right people, but every once in a while you have to be vulnerable. And so we see this, this great prophet Elijah who's, who's been a constant conduit through which God worked. He saw so many great things, so many powerful things happen in his lifetime, but he has just defeated the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel, which is this awesome, powerful thing that, that is an exciting story, right? Like if you saw God send down fire from heaven, how many of y'all would celebrate that? How many of y'all think you would hold on to that victory for a little while? Be a little excited about that. So he's just seen this great victory on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal being slaughtered, every single one of them. But, but now he's in a different mode, right? We see this different side of Elijah. And, and it says, starting in verse number two, so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me. Now, it's crazy to me that Jezebel after having seen her gods get shown out by the one and only true God, is still like holding out hope. But she's like, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. And Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Elijah was afraid. Like I had to reread that a couple times this week because I'm like, Elijah was this, this great prophet, right? Like, why is he afraid? This powerful man of God, this great leader who's seen miracles, who's seen signs, who's seen wonders, is afraid. Afraid for him means the same thing that it does for anybody else. It means Elijah was scared. But see, just because you have moments of great faith does not mean that you won't have moments of great fear. So it says, Elijah was afraid, and when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, and while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he came to a broom bush and sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I think Elijah had a little bit of my personality in him, a little bit over-exaggeration, a little bit of like, hey, this is the worst thing ever. Because somebody said something. Nothing's happened to him. But because somebody said something, he's freaking out. He's, he wants to die. 
which this is what's crazy. He's on the run from somebody who wants to kill him, but now that he's in a safe place, he says, God, I want to die. Like you're running from somebody who's going to kill you. Just stay there and let her take you out if you really mean it. I think he's just dramatic. But then he says something I can relate to. He says, I have had enough, Lord. I wonder if anybody's ever felt like that before. I wonder if anybody's ever felt like you reached a moment where you've had enough. Like, God, I cannot handle this anymore. I can't take any more. Don't send me any more blessings that are preceded by trials because I cannot handle any more stress. I can't handle any more disappointment. I can't handle any more frustration. I can't handle any more fear. God, I can't handle it anymore. Can't. He says, I can't handle it anymore. I've had enough. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. And he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And all at once, the angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He's on the run for his life. Finally takes a moment to chill out for a second. And the angel says, yo, get up and eat. The provision is here. But where we see Elijah here, he's in his lowest point. He's reached his lowest point. I don't know if you've ever had a lowest point before, but, but the lowest thing that you can think of, like the moment when you were like, this is it. You may be in it today, I don't know. But that's the moment that Elijah was in. He was like, this is it for me. Like, I, this is my lowest point. I, I can't handle it. And he's not on the, he's not freaking out because of anything that's happening to him. He's freaking out because of something that somebody said. And he says, this is, this is the end for me. Because what's amazing is a lot of times we'll get more attention to what the world says than what God said. But to be honest with you, I think he was just tired. Like, I think Elijah was tired. You ever felt that way before? You ever been tired? You ever been like, God, I I'm worn out. This is it. I'm not getting a whole lot of amens here, so y'all got it all put together. But I know that in my life, let me speak for me for a minute. I've had some moments where I cried out to God at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, like, God, I can't do this. I've had moments where I woke up in the middle of the night just in a frenzy with things going through my mind that I don't even know why I was thinking about them and had to say, God, I cannot handle this. And I'm tired. So Elijah has this moment, and he's tired. And he's frustrated, and he's crying out to God in this moment of, of vulnerability, and he's saying, God, I cannot, I cannot handle this. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of running. I'm tired of constantly being there for somebody else, only to have my life that's put in jeopardy. Ever felt like you put your head out for somebody else, put your neck out for somebody else, and you're the one that got in trouble for it? And Elijah, he's frustrated, and he's tired. And he's confused. And I think that part of the greatest problem was that everything's happening at the same time. His whole world is crashing down at the same time. All at once, he's facing it. And isn't that when it's frustrating? Because I can handle one battle at a time. But if I'm having to face 16 devils at the same time, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, like 16 real problems that I don't know how to handle and I don't have the answers to and I don't have the education for and I don't have the wisdom for. God, how do I do this? And he faces these moments and he says, I've, I've had enough. And so this morning, for, for this first week of one more, I want to talk to you on the subject of all at once. All at once. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for what you've done in this place. I thank you for what you did in the 930. But God, I thank you that you're going to take it to another level here in the 11. But God, I pray that you would help each and every one of us who came in today not to waste our time. But God, may we have come into this place today to engage and what you are going to say, to engage in what you are going to do. God, whatever is on our minds, I pray that you would help us to set it aside for these next few moments so that we can hear from you. Lord, I pray that you would put me on like a coat and wear me because I know I cannot do this on my own. Help them to see you and hear from you, and I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now, has this ever happened to you? Have you ever had a washer and dryer that died? Anybody had a washer and dryer die? You had by Okay, how many of you have ever had a washer or dryer that died in less than a year after you bought it? Anybody? 
Like one hand, two hands. My wife and I have. Because last year, right after we got married, our first major purchase was a washer and dryer. I didn't want to buy one. I had been borrowing to friends, but now he needed it back. So we had no choice. It's either we wash our clothes or I'm a grown married man who's going over to my mom's house to wash our clothes or her mom's house to wash their clothes. So I had, I, I had to call the shots here, mainly because she made me call the shots and said, let's get a washer and dryer. Hello, somebody. I got a witness. And so, so I'm like, okay, we can, we can get a washer and dryer. So we got married in May. In September of last year, we go and we buy a washer and dryer, brand new. Brand new. We take it home. We use it for a, less than a year because this September it stopped working. It would run, but it wouldn't dry anymore. Like you'd run, and this is what's frustrating. You spend an hour with the dryer running, then you go open the dryer and the clothes are still wet. You ever had that happen? We had it happen about 30 times before we finally said something ain't right. So Nicole did some research, and she found out that we were still under warranty. Praise the Lord for warranties. Because I'd already told her, I'm not buying another dryer. I'm not paying to have it fixed. Got a baby on the way. Priorities. Come on. I need a four-wheeler so I can get around our property, but we cannot get a dryer. And so I told her, I was like, you know, I, I'm glad we're under warranty because we're going to have to, we're going to put a clothesline out back. Right? And she's like, man, you can't do it. I'm like, they did it back in the day. And if they could do it back in the day, they can do it today. So I'm like, we're going to put a clothesline out in the back. String one out, hang our clothes up to dry, pray for no rain. I don't know how y'all did it, but that's what we were going to do. But we were under warranty, so it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Until the guy comes on Wednesday of last week, the tech, the guy who knows what he's doing. And he works on it for like 30 minutes, and then he calls us into the laundry room. And he's scratching his head, which is like a bad sign always. And he says, you know, I got some bad news. Of course you do. He said, the, the problem was an installation problem. And he said, there's these three screws. There's, for the power cord on a dryer, there's three little circle things with the cord coming out of it. I don't know the details. And you got to screw them into the back of the dryer. And he said, one of the screws was not in all the way. And it created friction. So it caught fire. Thank the Lord the house didn't burn down. But now the inside of the dryer is shot and this cord is no good. And since it was an installation issue, guess what? It ain't covered under warranty. I'm like, of course it's not. Why did, I mean, why have a warranty, right? They never cover anything. So, but he said, he said this, and this is when I got excited. He said, but you know what? I got good news. Whoever installed it has to pay for it. And I'm like, hot dog Jesus. Because now the people, hello, the people that we paid for the dryer got to give us money to pay for the repair. I like for people who I gave money to to have to give it back. And I was excited for this moment until I started having a flashback. And I remembered Nicole and I sitting in the store. And she said at the store, the owner said, hey, do you want to pay $150 for installation? And I'm a grown man. I'm a man. And we're newlyweds. And I feel like that money could be better spent elsewhere because I got you, boo. You ain't got to worry about nothing. I, can, I don't need another man coming in my house and installing things. I got this. And so I said, absolutely not. We don't want the installation. Which meant that they're not responsible for the repair, now I'm responsible for the repair. And so I had this moment where I humbled myself and I went to my wife because, see, she wanted to pay for installation. And I said, babe, sweetie, baby mama, you looking good in them jeans, you know what I'm saying? And then I said, I think I did the installation. And she was like, no, because if, if you would have done it, you would have done it right. See, she knew exactly what to say, but I'm, I'm like, you know what, you're right. 
why don't you just check? But she checks, and they're like, yeah, we have no record of any installation ever being done. So now it still falls back on us. And she said, we will forever pay for installation in all future experiences. To which I replied, if you work overtime to pay for it. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that because I wouldn't be here today. I'd be laying in my casket somewhere. But then I got to thinking, and this is why I got, I got to think, I, I was like, what happened? Because, like, I know, like, a screw should go all the way in. I get that. So I realized that I had three screws, and I dropped one of them down the air vent of the house. You know, when you drop something, and you, ah, oh, it's like slow, slow motion, but then it just goes wherever you don't want it to go, like the one place it shouldn't go, and it goes down, it goes down the air vent. And instead of going to Home Depot and getting another one, I said, I think I got something that looks like that in my garage. And I went out in the garage, and I got this screw, and it looked the same. But when I screwed it in, it didn't go in all the way. But I'm like, well, it looks good enough. Like, it looks the same as the other two screws. You get what I'm saying? Like, they look the same. So I'm thinking maybe it's normal that this screw not go in all the way. Maybe it's normal because it looked the same. But even though it looked the same, it wasn't the same. But since I thought that it was the same, and I thought that it was normal because it looked the same, it caused our dryer to become dysfunctional. And I believe that a lot of us in our lives have some moments where we've allowed the enemy to trick us into this false normalization where we think that because something happened to someone else, it's going to happen to us, and it's robbing us of what God has for us. And we've become crippled with dysfunction. Because it said in verse 2 that Jezebel said, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make you like one of them. She's telling Elijah, she's like, listen, you're going to be just like them. You're going to be just like all the prophets who are dead. And because they're dead, it means you're going to be dead. Because, you're, because their dream died, your dream will die. Because their vision died, your vision will die. Because their career died, your career will die. Because their business died, your business will die. Because their marriage died, your marriage will die. Because everything that they were believing for died, the same is going to happen to you. The enemy that the, that the lie that the enemy is always trying to tell us is you're just like them. You're just like them. And because it happened to them, it's going to happen to you. And what's causing a problem is so many of us are running from our potential instead of running to it because we've accepted the lie of the enemy that we're just like everybody else who tried but failed. But I got news for somebody in this place today. If God brought you to it, he will bring you through it. It does not matter what happened to somebody else. It doesn't matter what happened to your sister. It doesn't matter what happened to your friend. If if God brought you to it, he's going to bring you through it. You're not like everybody else. God, God created you to do what he's brought you to. But Jezebel, she speaks, she spoke, and Elijah ran. She spoke, and he ran. She didn't shoot him. She didn't, like, surround him with this army. She just said something. And I wonder if anybody in here has been allowing the enemy to say some things that have been dictating the way that you corrected your future. I wonder if anybody's been allowing the enemy to speak into your life and then it's been causing you to go back on what God said. See, this is a man who has seen God move. This is not a newbie. This is a guy who had actually seen God move, and he's going back on the power that God gave him simply because of what the enemy said, not because of anything she's done. But see, when you listen to the enemy, and when you focus on what the enemy has to say, then you start giving it more clout than what God had to say. And you start forgetting what God's spoken in your life. Just because the enemy told you that it's over for you and you're never going to make it and you're going to lose, it does not matter because God said you're more than a conqueror. Even though the enemy said that you don't have what it takes and that you'll never make it and that you can't do it, it does not matter because God said you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Even though the enemy may have said that you're unlovable, it does not matter because God said that while you were yet a sinner... While you were at your worst, 
while you were at their lowest, while you were yet a sinner, Christ loved you enough to come and die on the cross for your sins. I don't care what he told you. I don't care what she told you. I don't care what the enemy's been feeding you. If God said you're loved, you are loved. If God said you're chosen, you are chosen. If God said you're called, it does not matter what hell said, you are called. So she spoke and he ran. And Elijah went from being anointed and appointed to scared and afraid simply at a word. See, I believe in grabbing hold of a word and running with it. But you got to be careful what word you grab onto. So Jezebel spoke a word and Elijah, Elijah ran for no reason. No reason. Like I know that he was threatened. I know that, that it seemed like it looked. You ever had a moment in your life where it looked like you had a reason to be upset, but when you got to the other side, you saw that it wasn't nothing but a thing, and God had it under control the whole time? So, so Jezebel, she, she speaks, and Elijah ran for no reason. None. There was a threat, but that's all that it ever was. Not a single word that Jezebel spoke against Elijah's life ever came to pass. Not a single word. But because she spoke, Elijah ran. And she said, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you're not dead by this time tomorrow. By this time tomorrow. In 24 hours, Elijah will be dead. In 24 hours, his mission, his vision, the thing that God's given him will be gone. I will have his head on a platter in 24 hours, but I got to tell somebody that 24 hours passed and Elijah did not die. 48 hours passed and Elijah did not die. 72 hours passed and Elijah did not die. 96 hours passed and Elijah did not die. One week passed and Elijah did not die. One month passed and Elijah did not die. One year passed. And Elijah did not die. One decade passed. And Elijah did not die. One century passed. And Elijah did not die. One thousand years passed. And Elijah did not die. It has been two thousand years. 800 years and Elijah has yet to die. You know why? Because when heaven starts it, it does not matter what hell says, they cannot stop it. What God has started in your life, he is going to finish. I know it may not look like it. I know you may have been let go and you've been wondering how God's going to do what he said he would do and what you're facing. But if God spoke it, it doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how unqualified you are. God will finish it. He will finish what he started. Elijah ran from what God had for him because of what she spoke. But he still never died. To this day, he has not died because you can't stop when heaven starts. Tell somebody, can't touch this. Can't touch this. So Jezebel, she, she, tries, to, she tries to trick him, and this is what the enemy does. He, he tries to give you false normalization. He tries to make you think that, that because it happened to somebody else, it's normal and will happen to you. That you'll face the same thing that everybody else faced. But then he tries to resort, he tries to compound that. Because see, this, the enemy is slick. He's slick. Like you think that you can just kind of go through life floating and make it just because you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. No, he is slick. He's slick. you got to constantly be aware. Because what he does is he causes you to start to doubt some things. Right? By telling you, you're just like everybody else. And if it happened to them, it's going to happen to you. So now that you're questioning what God placed in your heart, and you're questioning where God has taken you, then he tries to get you, and the next thing I need you to see, into lonely isolation. Get you to isolate yourself. Because it said in verse number three that Elijah, Elijah said, when he came to Beersheba and Judah, he left his servant there. He told his servants to stay where he was while Elijah himself 
went a day's journey into the wilderness. He left his servant that had been with him all along, who had seen God move, who had seen God work in Elijah's life. He left him there and went on his own. Because one of the greatest temptations the enemy brings into your life when you're feeling overwhelmed is to get you to draw back into isolation. To get you to retreat into isolation. To think that you're the only one. To think that nobody's there for you. Because he knows that you are stronger with somebody else. He knows that when you pair arms with another believer, when you pair arms with somebody who's seen God move on your behalf, who's seen what God did, who can remind you time and time again. I know it looks bleak now, but do you remember when we were on the Mount Carmel and it looked like we weren't going to make it out and we looked like we were going to die and God showed up anyways? The enemy knows if he can get them out of your life, if he can get the reminder of God's goodness out of your life, that he can take you a little lower. And so the enemy will try to get people out of your life by telling you that there's no point in going to church. There's no point in praying about it. There's no point in attending an Elevate group. There's no point in reaching out and saying that you need help because nobody's going to care and nobody's going to understand and nobody's going to help you and nobody wants to listen to that and nobody wants your drama. But the truth is God placed people in your life for a reason. For a reason. And one of the greatest lies that the enemy will tell you is that you are alone. You're alone. You're the only one that's ever been on your own. You're the only one that's ever been single this long. You're the only one that's ever had a marriage this tumultuous. You're the only one who's ever had a kid who wasn't acting right. You're the only one. You're the only one. And nobody wants to hear about it. And nobody cares about it. And yet God's word says that we are to be there for one another. So it's no wonder that the enemy is trying to get us apart from each other. This is why the enemy does this. Because he knows that one puts 1,000 to flight, two puts 10,000 to flight. Oh, you thought you were the only one who knew that. No. He knows the same thing you know. So the enemy, the enemy's always trying to, to cause us to go into isolation. And to isolate ourselves. And to think that we're the only one and that nobody cares and nobody wants to be there and nobody wants to help us because the enemy knows that as long as somebody else is there to pick you back up, as long as somebody is there to hold your hand, as long as somebody is there to walk through the fire with you, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went in together, they were already more powerful than if Shadrach had gone in by himself. So the enemy knows that as long as you have somebody with you, that you're stronger. So he tries to get you to isolate yourself. But the truth is, a lot of times we do it for him. We isolate ourselves for him because we think that, that nobody wants to listen to us. But when you are going through a difficult time, that is not the time for isolation. That's not the time to stop attending church. That's not the time to ignore phone calls. It's not the time to stop reaching out. It is the time to reach out because that's why God placed them in your life. It said that Elijah left his servant there. It does not say that Elijah's servant left him, but Elijah left his servant there. Elijah said, I got to do this on my own. I got myself into this mess, and now I'm going to leave you here and go there by myself. But when God gives you somebody, it doesn't matter if you got yourself into the mess on purpose or on accident or whatever, but if God sent you somebody, he sent them to you knowing exactly where you would be on that day. But the enemy he tries to get us to, to isolate ourselves, to try to go through it alone, try to handle it on our own, to be the only one because he knows that he could take us down. But then if that doesn't work, then the last thing I need you to see is he'll use wrong magnification. He'll cause you to magnify the wrong thing in your life. He'll cause you to start looking at your failures instead of looking at your victories. He'll cause you to start looking at the times that you thought God forsook you instead of looking at the times that God was with you all along. And it said in verse, in verse number four, five, it said, or four, it says, I have had enough. 
take my life, I am no better than my ancestors. Elijah said, I've had enough. I've had enough. He was so overwhelmed with what he was facing. He was so overwhelmed with what he was experiencing in that moment that he couldn't even think back to a few days before when God delivered him off Mount Carmel. The problem is a lot of us have long-term memory about our losses, but we have short-term memory about our victories. And we're so easy to forget the times that we fell short or didn't make it or to remember those, but we forget the times that God was with us. And so we start magnifying all the wrong things. And Elijah said, this is it. I've had enough. I'm done with it. And maybe you're here today and you feel that way. Or maybe you felt that way before. And I get it. I get it. I, I get it. I understand that it's like it's too much. Got to have the crazy kids. I was a good kid. My parents were blessed. But everybody else got crazy kids. God, I got a crazy spouse. None of y'all looking around. God, I got, I got bills to pay. I have no money. I have no job. This is too much. I'm frustrated. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. I don't know how to handle this situation, God. I, I'm not trained for this. And we're looking at all the wrong things. But see, I would never, I would never fake and act like I understand everything that you're going through because everything, everybody goes through different things. Everybody has different struggles. But, but I want to propose something today. I want to propose that while the enemy is bringing things at your life all at once, God is simultaneously bringing things all at once. While, while the enemy is trying to bombard you with, with stress and with frustration and with, with insecurities and with battles, God is simultaneously coming into your life with the provision that you need. But could it be, and I asked this in the first service, I don't know, could it be maybe, just maybe, that the reason that we're so overwhelmed with the devil is because we're so underwhelmed with God? Could it be that the reason that we're so, so stressed out is because we're focusing too much on what the enemy is bringing our way? Because see, what you believe in determines what you invest in. And a lot of us are investing so much time in fighting the enemy and in worrying about the enemy and in fighting the battle that we're missing out the moment that God is trying to bring provision into our life. We're so busy trying to fight everybody else, fight everything else. And the whole time God is trying to bless us, but we can't even see it. God's trying to say, get up and eat, but we don't even know it's there because we're so busy looking behind us trying to make sure nobody's coming to get us. So we get so focused on the wrong thing. I am a iPhone, Apple, a holic, and I don't apologize for it, and I'm not sorry. And if you have an Android, I am sorry because I feel bad for you. <clears throat> but I believe he's a God of second chances. I believe he's a God of restoration. But one thing, one thing that, that they always tell you if you Google it, right, because a lot of people... The biggest complaint about iPhones is that the phones die, right? Like they die so fast. They, they die so quick. Like the battery, the battery life is not good, right? And they even have cases where you can charge your phone. They have cases so that your phone is always charged, which, by the way, just a PSA, that's worse for your phone than just letting it die because if your phone's constantly charging, then it's going to die all the time. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. So one of the things they tell you is that you need to close out the apps that you have apps running in the background. Now, I was corrected after the first service, and I was told that Apple tells you not to do that, but everybody online tells you to do it. And if it's on Google, it's true. So, <laughs> just kidding. <clears throat> but everybody on Google, they tell you to do this. So they tell you that you have all of these apps, and if your phone is dying, that you need to close out the app. See how many apps I got running? See, all these apps are running on my phone right now. And that's how a lot of us are in our lives. We have all these different things going on in our mind. We have all these different battles that we're facing in the moment. We have all these struggles that we're facing and we don't know how to handle them and we don't know what to do with them and we're trying to figure them out. So, so they tell you that, that you can swipe up to close out an app. So you can just, you got this battle and you can swipe up to close it out. And, and you got this battle and you can swipe up to close it out. Here's the problem though. 
I just closed out three battles, but I still have about 30 more. Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever felt like, God, I just won a victory, but now I'm facing another battle? God, I just won a victory, but now I'm facing another battle. God, I felt like I had that one won, but now it's come back again. God, I don't know how to handle it. And so we have all these things that we're trying to handle all at one time. We have all these battles that we're trying to take care of at once. And we're trying to close it out. And it's no wonder that we're tired. It's no wonder we're frustrated. Because it's one after the other, after the other, after the other. Battles. Battles. Then we have scars, and then we have battles, and then before we're even healed, we have another battle. And we have all this frustration and all these struggles. But God is saying, he said it in verse number five, let me just show you. Instead of, show, he said, lay down under the bush, and he fell asleep. <clears throat> and all at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He fell asleep. Then the angel said, get up and eat. See, we're trying to, we got this bill, and, and then we got our spouse doing that, and then we got, we got that struggle, and we're trying to close out all these things on our own. But God is saying, if you will just turn it off, if you'll just rest, if you'll just sleep, then you can see that all at once I have provision there for you to eat. All at once, I have brought provision. While you've been fighting that battle and fighting that battle and fighting that struggle and wanting to give up and wanting to quit and not knowing what to do, I've been having the provision sent your direction. But if you will just rest, then you'll be able to see what I've been doing all along. All at once. All at once, the angel said, get up and eat. All at once, the angel said, your provision is here. Your blessing is here. What you've been praying for is here. But he couldn't see it. He couldn't see it. And I believe that God sent me today to tell somebody that's been struggling, that's been stressed out, that's been running, who's had some sleepless nights, who's had some nights where you just couldn't stop crying, who's had some days where you didn't even want to get up in the morning. I believe God said that it's time to see that all at once, he's brought your provision. All at once, he's doing what he said he would do all along. All at once. Only God can take the great mess that you've created or that you've encountered or that you've inherited and turn it into greatness. Only God can take what you've been facing and turn it into what you've been believing for. But you have to stop chasing. You have to stop chasing. You have to stop trying to chase the joy, chase the peace, Chase the happiness. Some of us, we're so busy trying to chase everything else that it's caused us to become more miserable. We're so busy trying to chase and figure out why we're so unhappy and why we can't find happiness. And it's only causing us to have a deep, darted root of bitterness that we never had before. Because we're trying to chase the very thing that God is bringing into our lives. Stop chasing what God is trying to send and see that all at once, God is there with the provision. All at once, God has what you need. Would you stand with me, please? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here today and I was sharing in the the 930 service, actually, I told him, <clears throat> I had somebody in, in a position of leadership in their job this week who told me, you know, I'm so frustrated because I, I just feel like I can never get done what I need to be done. And I've, there's many days that I just think about quitting. Like there's many days that I think about just stepping down. And I told them, I said, you know what? I do the same thing. There's days when I just think, God, this is too much. God, I don't have the education. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the know-how. And maybe there's somebody else. But every time God speaks and he says, if it wasn't where I wanted you to be, then I wouldn't have put you there. 
because God gives us everything that we need. The point is, we do not have what it takes. The point is, we do not have the answers. And if you do have the answer for everything you're facing, you're not doing big enough. You're not dreaming big enough. We don't have what it takes because God is the answer. God is enough. And, and maybe you're here today and you've struggled like I have, like my friend had, and you said, you know, I just don't think I can handle it anymore. I don't think I have what it takes to be able to push through, to have, to have another day that is so frustrating. I can't, I just can't seem to get ahead. And I've had thoughts about giving it all up. But if that's you today and you're here and you say, but I, I know that God placed me there for a reason. I know God called me to this. And I know he'll see me through this. But I have to have some strength. I have to have his peace. I have to feel him wrap his arms around me. If you're here today and you say, I have to have God's help to make it through what I'm going through. If you would, slip your hand right up and right back down. Yes, 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 yes. I can't do it on my own. I have to have God's help. I want to pray for each and every one of us who lifted our hands this morning. God, I thank you that, that you love us enough that you never leave us alone. You never leave us by ourselves. God, I thank you that, that even when it seems impossible, even when it seems like we can't make it, even when it seems like we'll never get out of what we're facing, God, I thank you that you are with us. I thank you that you are there in the midst of us. And God, I pray that you would wrap your arms around us today. God, I pray that you would help us to know that you are there, to help us to know that you love us. In spite of what people have said, in spite of what the enemy has said, God, I thank you that you love us enough to pull us through. And God, I pray that you would give us a peace that passes all understanding. I pray that you would give us an assurance that is greater than anything we've ever experienced before. God, I know that we have a lot of things going in our mind. I know that a lot of people this morning even have trouble focusing on what's being said because there's so many things outside of these walls that they're going through. But God, I pray that as they go throughout this week that you would help them to just feel a burden lifted off of them. That they would know that those who are, who are really reaching out saying, God, I have to have this, that you would meet them and that they would know, God, that you are with them and that you are bringing the provision all at once. And I thank you for it today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now put your hands together this morning if you're thankful.